So good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. I know this is towards the end of the day. This is the time of day where the caffeine is run out. The water is warm and all you want to do is leave here and go drink. Okay. So uh, the first thing that I want to kind of um, clarify is who this presentation is for. And it is for developers. Um, I'm not going to pull any punches. A lot of the techniques and strategies and what I'm about to talk about is an advanced topic. But each piece builds upon the other. So you can implement some of it, implement all of it. Either way, no matter if you work on, um, you're a solo developer or you work on a team or it's just you and your buddy or whatever, you will get something out of it. But this is geared for WordPress teams of two people or more. But again, I use these on when I was a freelancer and a solo developer. Uh, so authentication failed. Every time I try to do the remote, it never works. So, all right. So, DevCraft. All right. This is really the uh, the science, the art of development. This is the meta process. This is what you do while you're doing what you do. And uh, so, again, this is being, going to be uh, a series of pro tips, things I've developed over the last 14 years of my career, stealing ideas from not only all over the WordPress community, but uh, multiple programming language communities and really just the development culture and the hacker culture that gave birth to everything that we use now, including open source. So who I am is the chief technology officer of um, Chicago's premier web design uh, studio called Blueprint. And uh, we've been using uh, WordPress there for five years. I've been using WordPress about as long. Um, I have 14 years development experience. Um, I used PHP before there were even calls to MySQL, and we were writing everything to flat files. If, um, and our first, uh, one of our first clients that we used that with was uh, CompuServe. So if that dates me, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I've contributed to Core. I have a dozen or so plugins um, out in the wild. Um, I'm also a lead developer of the K2 theme you may have heard of, um, and uh, which was founded by the person, uh, Michael Heilman, who did the original default theme called Kubrick, K2 is Kubrick 2. I got involved in that, and it's the theme framework that, because of a lack of documentation, nobody knows how awesome it is, uh, which is partially my fault. Um, a polyglot programmer, which means I program in multiple languages. Um, I highly, highly recommend, even if you never use these languages um, for your clients, learn Python, it'll make you a better PHP programmer. Learn Ruby, and then you'll also understand different ways that like the object model is represented in various languages, all of which gives you a wider array um, of techniques and ways of thinking about and solving problems. So I highly, highly recommend studying other languages than your primary. And as you can see, Matt Mullenweg has certified me as one of the three most important people in WordPress. And uh, I'm very, very proud of this. And uh, it means nothing more than uh, I can download WordPress for free, which I think you guys have that right too, so I may have been chipped a little bit. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from, uh, from magic. Arthur C. Clarke, a famous science um, fiction writer, said that. If your job is to wield that magic, then you better know your incantations before this happens. When things go out of control, and they will during any development project, your process, your development methodologies are what are going to keep you sane, because there's going to be things that you can count on. <coughs> so it's fraught with dangers. It's fraught with unexpected things. It's fraught with, uh, you know, scope creep. And can you add this feature? Or you know, you find out your architecture, your you know, the way you designed your plugin is never going to scale, and uh, your process is your saving throw. It's going to keep you. Um, you know, being able to go, okay, you know what? We did back ourselves into a corner with this code. So how do we get out of that? So it makes you flexible. Uh, the components of a mature development process, task management, source control, multiple server environments, configuration management, uh, content synchronization, continuous integration, one-step deployments, iterative development, automated testing. There's a lot behind each one of these. And what I'm going to do is kind of give you the, the highlights and the stuff you can really take away and just start to implement slowly in your own process. 
So I'm going to start with task management. Task management shouldn't, let me put it this way, your brain is fallible, right? You, you know all the things you want to do for a site, you know what you want it to be at the end, but if you can't describe that and pass that off to other people, you'll never be able to add another person to your team. Much less, you'll never be able to get you and your client or whoever the project stakeholder is to agree on what done means. And if you can't do that, and you've been on a project that just seemed to never end, it's because you didn't define what success meant. And task management is the first step in doing that. You want to break your project down. Every single project, we you know, may get a PSD or we design the concept for the client, and we'll actually sit down and go, what are all the elements? Many of them are very common. Logo, header, foot, or navigation, this thing, sidebar, widgets, all of that. And we just describe everything we can see on the page, what functionality may be behind it. Um, some tasks you want to break down and split between design and development tasks. You know, someone's got to create the widget with the options, and then somebody needs to make it look like something once it's dropped into a sidebar, that kind of thing. Break it down as discreet as possible. You want tickets that are closable in 15 minutes of coding. Boom, move on to the next thing. You find something that needs to get done, write a ticket, write the code, close it. Always, always, always be marking down everything that comes up. You can create a backlog of stuff. Maybe you're nice to have features. You know, that's, that's kind of where I put feature creep. Well, let's put it on the list you know, kind of low priority. And then when a project ships, you know, always go back to that backlog and look what the next phase is going to look like. And, uh, and it ensures you're not going to miss anything. If you can, write them as use cases, which goes something like this. As a user, I can log into a system and see all the posts that I've ever created. You know, this is built into WordPress, obviously. But the custom functionality, if you can really write it from the user's point of view, sometimes the, uh, the actor in a use case is the system. You know, the system ensures that you know, passwords must be of a significant um, complexity in order to, be, you know, to validate. The more you can write it like that in plain English, the more not only you can understand, but your client can understand. If it's filled with you know, implementation details and technical mumbo jumbo, no one, no one you know, but you maybe can understand that, especially if um, you're working with new people or you're trying to bring new people onto the team, you're going to have a vocabulary that you know, maybe you've developed over time and acronyms and all of that stuff. The clearer you can describe what needs to happen, the easier it is going to be to implement. You should document them in a system you can trust. Uh, track is what the WordPress um, project uses. It's open source and integrates with uh, different source control tools, um, primarily Subversion. Um, Unfuddle as a hosted service is what I use. You know, I've got enough system administration tasks to deal with. I really don't want to manage my you know, source control and setting up a new track instance and all these things. Bugzilla is also pretty good. There's plenty of, of ticket management systems. The Really, when you're, def, def, when you're deciding which one to use, you want it to be able to be flexible and extensible. You want to be able to you know, adapt it to your needs really easily. Um, and you really want to be able to assign these and mark them off and have kind of a ticket workflow you know, of being able to say what's done, maybe send it to somebody for verification, and then they can mark it as closed. Some kind of workflow that works for you. And it doesn't have to be um, incredibly complex. It should be really easy. Um, and really what you want to make sure you don't do is have a system that creates a ton of, ton of busy work. Um, Basecamp is probably not a really good use of this. The to-dos are not a great way to track um, development tasks because you can't really integrate it with your source control software. Um, uh, track and Unfuddle both have what's known as powerful commit messages, so you can actually reference bugs while you're actually committing code and that kind of thing. The reason you use it is really it provides visibility. What's left to be done? You know, what, who did what? Who touched this? Who said this feature was done? It's crap. You know, I mean, all of that is going to help you document your project as you go along. And the history of that is even more important. Who introduced this code? Let me go find, you know, who closed out that feature, and okay, we'll blame the temp that was on board for just a couple of weeks, you know, and, and his crappy code. Now we know why we fired him. And really for your project managers, even if your clients, um, uh, Unfuddle is a very developer-friendly um, system and not so much for clients, but I put them on the system. They've been blasted with emails, with source commits, and all this stuff. It's a fire hose of information that they have to um, manage, but you can still see a graph. 
there's, you know, 24 tickets uh, were opened, 12 of them were closed, we're 50% done. You know, and of course that's kind of a moving target, obviously, as you go, you're gonna add more tickets and more clothes, but you'll always be able to know where you stand, and that's what your task management system should do. Source control. How many people in here use source control right now? And how many people who didn't raise their hand are developers? Okay, if you're working with a developer that isn't using source control, find another developer. I mean, seriously, this is like 101. Because what a source control system does, you know, for those who don't know, is it allows every time you save, to save a version of that, which means you can roll back, you can merge with other people, you can stay synchronized between, you know, development environments. Um, it is the one tool, if you bring anything away from this, this is the, this is the thing to implement. Every project, no matter how small, should belong in a repository. If you're using Subversion, you know, or, or a system that's hosting that, there's some significant um, costs involved as far as, you know, it's got this remote and things like that. For smaller projects, I'll, I'll turn to a distributed system like Git or Mercurial, um, because you can do a repository locally and it doesn't need to go anywhere or sync anywhere, but at least I know I can still go back and go, you know what, five commits ago I had this working, what, what the hell happened? And I can roll back and find that out. You want to commit basically every time you make some progress. Don't necessarily commit broken code, you know, unless you know you're only committing it so you can bring it over to your senior developer and go, fix this for me, and he, you know, and he wants to be able to pull it down onto his own laptop or whatever. Um, but you want to commit early, you want to commit often, same with saving. Um, and every time that you check in, you get to provide a message of what that is. Now, the tool itself is going to tell you the what. It's going to tell you what file and where in that file you made the change. So your commit message should not reflect that. You want to know the why. What were you thinking? Why, why did you implement it a certain way? What benefit did it bring? You know, was there some piece of elegance uh, to the code that you wrote that you want to make sure that other people know? This is, again, helping you document your code base. You don't have to sit here and write, you know, go at the very end of the project um, how they used to do it in, uh, and, and how they still do it in a lot of large corporate environments is, uh, you know, oh, we're going to write a bunch of code, and we have all the specs first, and write a bunch of code, and then we're going to sit here and document the system. This can really document it al along the way. And anytime you have a question, you can always go back to your source control and your task management system to really know what the project is. You don't look at code for a while. You know, you uh, need to come back and maintain a project. Again, these are going to help you get context, and that's what your commit messages should provide. There's a lot of really advanced things you can do with source control. Most people know basic, you know, let me clone or, or check out a project, let me, um, you know, write some code, commit it, maybe add new files, that kind of thing. But um, when you're working with a lot of plugins and outside libraries, or maybe you're developing a, a set of components for yourself, you might want to create a single repository that stores all of those things. And I'm even going to use uh, Subversion um, as the example here. Um, so there's a feature of Subversion called SVN Externals, which lets you say, hey, this folder here actually should come from this other repository, and you get to pull it into your project. And what's great is, let's say you fix a bug in some you know, shared plugin that you use on every project, you can actually push that code back up and it'll go back to its sort of separate um, and unique repository, as well as being a part of the um, main uh, repository, project repository that you're working on. What this, and then you can also like pin it at ver different versions and that kind of thing. And in large scale development, it almost becomes essential. If you're used to using a lot of premium plugins especially, you know, this is a great way to store them all in one place and sort of know that they're up to date. When you need to do um, uh, an update to them, you can update the vendor repository and then every project can just pull from that and it really saves you a lot of time. Getting to know your source control, getting to know some of these advanced workflows and solving problems in your workflow with the tools that are at your disposal, will it'll change your life. It, source control will literally change your life. It's, there is no more tool that is crucial, and I've, I've been kind of hoping to drill that in. And if you don't believe it now, the first time that you know that you can you know, restore some, some deleted file from your client's server because they were mucking around in FTP, you know, with Subversion, you'll, you'll 
see the light. And you really do owe it to yourself to just learn it like the back of your hand. Your clients are depending on you to you know, have your shit together. Your teammates are depending on you to know that you're working with the tool in the same way and using the same workflows. So really study it. The Subversion has a free book online. Uh, Git, if you're using that, there's plenty of tutorials and books and videos and all kinds of stuff. I mean, the, the information's out there. Um, because what, you know, some of these tools have very um, archaic beginnings and they're evolutions of tools that have been used since, you know, the beginning of uh, computer science. And, uh, you know, some of the error messages and some of the things that you can get yourself into, especially when you add new developers who are new to Subversion um, to a project, it, you, you're going to find yourself needing to know sort of how it, does this tool actually operate on the files? What does it actually care about? What is it diffing? You know, the process in which it knows one change to another and that kind of thing. Knowing how that works will actually allow you to, you know, pull yourself out of sticky situations when you have a merge conflict or, or, or some other um, error on your screen. Uh, the developers in the room, how many of you um, use a local development server? Do you have a dedicated development environment, like an integration server? Do you have a staging server? And then a production server, right? Where is it going when it goes to go live, right? So multiple server environments basically isolate versions of your project. You know, you've got your local server. That's just saving you round trips. You can you know, write some code, save the file, hit refresh in your browser, and it's all right there. You don't got to do anything. Once you know it's working and you can test and debug locally and all of those, those great things, you can send, you know, do your commit and send it back up. Your development environment is really an integration server. It's the one server where all the code's going to end up from all the developers. So work, shit works great on your local. You find out that when it integrates with somebody else's plugin or you know the template file or whatever that just got edited, you're going to find that there's going to be problems that you didn't think of. Your development environment probably is also not running OS X or Windows, which you are locally. So now you're also getting into what's going to be closer to production. And the closer you can make it to production, running the same version of the operating system, similar hardware, as close as you can get. But it's going to be chaotic. You'll never, you can never count on dev working, which is why you have a staging server or a QA server. You want somewhere that's clean, blessed builds. You know all this stuff works, all the content is on that database um, as it should be. This is what your client should see. This is what, um, you know, what maybe your project manager or your QA guy um, is testing against. It's the one place that nobody touches. You're gonna send, you know, code there once you know it's working and then get out of the way. Go back to just integrating on the development server. Um, a lot of times uh, in, in bigger environments, the staging server may even be used by sales. You know, they want to show off the beta of the new features and stuff. So that you need a place that's not production, but it is also is treated with just as you know, much care. And then obviously production is where the site lives and that's how users get to it. It really should look like this. It's a flow from one environment to the other. You start developing on your local, you push it up to your development server, you move it to staging when you're ready to test, and then it goes to production. And this happens in a round trip fashion over and over and over again. It really does speed up development, especially your local server. If anything, get a local, learn how to configure it. It's not that hard. Um, and it tightens up the feedback loop. If your client can kind of see things as they're coming along and you have weekly builds going out to staging, they can see visual progress. Most of them can't you know, see past the, the, CS, you know, the basic CSS framework of uh, your parent theme that you're using and going, oh no, really, here's all the widgets and you can see them and they're like, this looks nothing like the PSD. You know, they don't really can make that leap. You know? So being able to see things um, fall into place, even though they know, hey, you know, I mean, it's not due for another month, but it looks like the home page is done. And then you go, yeah, the home page is done. You know, um, so it just helps you get that feedback quicker. You know, if they see something, you go, wait a second, you know, this isn't what I thought this interaction was going to be like. Um, you know, and then they come back and, you know, you have to change your implementation a little bit or something like that. So you want them to see things as early as possible, but you also want to make sure that what they see is also what is presentable. You know, you get to control that, and that's why you have a staging environment. If you have to and you cut out staging, use your development server as that. Just let them know that things can sometimes break and you know, tell them when it's good to look at and that kind of thing. Configuration management. So in a larger enterprise environment, it means nothing what I'm about to describe. What I mean 
is that managing your configuration file, in this case wconfig, and a couple of other server configurations in such a way that you don't clobber yourself when you're moving from these environments. As you can see, you know, we're building up you know, layer by layer. You know, without source control, you can never have multiple environments. Without uh, multiple environments, you wouldn't even need this configuration management. Um, and it actually makes, uh, they all start to fit in together like a puzzle. The problem is, each server environment is likely to have different file paths, maybe even different database names and stuff. I know if you're on like, um, like a cPanel hosted um, uh, site or something like that, like your database prefixes and stuff may, not the WordPress one, but like the name, the actual name of the database may be forced upon you and your users and stuff. So you may have different things between your server environments, but for the most part, everything else is going to work. A post is a post is a post. Right? So what you need to do is actually make your config smarter. So the first thing that you need to do is your server needs to know who it is. You need to tell it, and it needs to tell uh, everybody else, who am I? So this is a typical Apache vi uh, virtual host config. Um, this is one I stole off my local. As you can see, my user Zentech uh, sites folder is where I store all my projects. Um, the bolded part, though, is an Apache feature called set environment. And the web environment, uh, or web env variable, is, it can be named anything. And then the third one is the actual value. Um, you can set as many of these as you want, right? And Apache just happily publishes them. I put them in the virtual host container um, because it's usually not under version control. It's usually very well protected. Um, you know, generally the only, the only guy who can touch this is somebody with sudo access or root on your server if you're using um, Unix or Linux, and I hope that you are. Uh, uh, and this is very Apache specific, but I imagine most of you are probably hosting your sites with Apache. So now that your server knows who it is, now it needs to tell everybody else what it is. So your site needs to then go, hey, where am I at? So there's a variable, or excuse me, a function in PHP. This is not a WordPress function. This is a, this is a um, if you're running Apache, this function will be defined. And as you can see, I'm saying, hey, what's the value of web environment? You know, this is me asking the server, where am I? So if you know that, then your configuration can actually adapt itself to where it's running. So hopefully this reads pretty good. It came out pretty good. So, uh, at the top, this is a, a ternary operator that basically says, hey, if I'm running an Apache um, and this function exists, then, and there's a value set for this, this is, would evaluate to false if that web environment variable didn't work, then get that value. If not, set it to production. Uh, the reason I use this idiom is actually most of my production um, sites run on Nginx, so it's an alternative that doesn't have the, the patchy stuff. But really, once I get down to that, I know that that's basically the default case. And for every developer on the project, you can see the top one um, is defined as Zentech. That's my local. And I set and override some built-in WordPress constants, the content directory, the content URL, plugin directory URL, site URL, and site home. And then I also put um, WD uh, debug in there because people want to turn that on and off for various reasons and obviously you don't want it you know debug turned on in production or anything like that for every environment that you define you just add another block it's very easy for a new developer to get on board they come in they copy one of the other blocks customize it to meet their needs if you um, need to uh, put your database configuration you could also you know, take it out from the top and put it in here and define it separately. I generally try to make sure they're all named the same. Um, you know, I, I have virtually absolute, well, I do have absolute control over all my servers, so I get to set things up a certain way. But you could customize it to fit your needs. Um, you want to make your um, database connection parameters more secure. Set um, variables with them, just like you did the web environment. Set those in your vhost. And one place that even the web process doesn't get, you know, the Apache um, launches it, root, reads its configuration files, and moves on. Um, so there's no way a hacker who can get access to your site is going to find its way into the vhost to actually get your database credentials. So you could replace them with Apache get environment, database name, and database user, and that kind of thing. So you can see where really any PHP will actually run here. And you can 
you know, customize the logic and uh, various bits right here in the config file to fit your needs. Um, the last bit here, the W uh, config, I've found in some environments that it, even if you set debug to true, it actually still doesn't show you true errors. Um, so display errors is a, a PHP INI setting. That way you can just be like, seriously, dump them. I need to know what's happening because nothing else is telling me. So replace where it says wdebug with this. Uh, I have a, as a snippet in, in TextMate, so I can just type wpconfig, tab it out, and it replaces it with, um, you know, with, with this basic standard block. And, uh, and you're good to go. This, more than anything else, will allow you to run in multiple environments. Everybody's local is going to have a different path. Maybe people don't want to store it in their sites folder. Maybe some people are on Windows and stuff like that. It really helps to normalize that. Because when you define home and site URL, you get to override the database. This is the, the um, general settings screen. With these grayed out, um, they are not now editable. So every environment moves into it says, hey, I know what domain I should be running under. And that's all that's needed. You don't need to hack your database or do anything else. This alone will make sure your database is now portable. <coughs> because really, you want to make it easy to move from environment to environment. Even if it's just from your local to production, you know, that alone you know, uh, is going to save your life. It's going to save you time. And it's going to save you headaches when you go to deploy your site live. Um, another sort of uh, gotcha here. Real fast, that's sure. The uh, whole configuration of everything between development and you know, our local host to the production server. Um, how do you manage multiple WordPress installs? Do you have 50 WordPress installs on your local server? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, each project has its own repository. I keep them separate. Um, I will point out that I have not developed a version of this that works for multi site. There's a couple of extra things that happen there. Um, it, it's, it would be possible, it would be a lot more code to sort of manage sort of the ways that multi-site works. But yeah, every, you know, I mean, because every site has, you know, every new WordPress site has a WP config. So every single one of them gets one of these. You know, even if I, you know, I mean, there's some like quick and dirty stuff. I don't even do a local. But I still just kind of use the same model every time. Um, you know, the templates I use for my virtual host containers in each environment already have their web environment variable set, so it becomes like, if I need it, it's there. If I don't, I don't, you know. And then, like I said, for multi-site and BuddyPress, it's less, um, it, it, it just it isn't as clean as this. So what, that's where your development server really comes in handy, because then that becomes kind of like everybody's local. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a couple more slides. So it overrides the database. I really wish that more configuration, um, you know, uh, constant definitions could actually override database settings because then you could really start to create basically a configuration file that could be even more portable than it is. Um, so one other gotcha that uh, moving from environment to environment that generally happens is that um, the media library, when you're sticking, you know, inserting into posts and that kind of thing, inserts the domain name and it drives me nuts. Every time I see that, go and slice off the domain, um, which means you want to use absolute relative URL. So uh, an absolute URL is domain, full path, everything. Uh, relative URL is relative to the current document, which you, you know, in a WordPress environment, you really can't um, depend on that except from like the CSS style sheet. That's about the only one that says, hey, I already know where I'm at, and obviously isn't dynamic enough to be able to use like blog info and, you know, and that kind of, um, you know, some of the built in variables and functions and stuff that are available in WordPress. So you really need to guard against that. Everybody on the team should know, even people that are just entering content, hey, lop that off. Um, Sort of the flip of that is if you're using like those all-in-ones MAMP or WAMP or whatever, um, typically out of the box, it wants to make everything in a subdirectory, that's going to screw you up. Production isn't in a subdirectory. Well, most of your production sites aren't. So you really need to um, uh, configure your local and your development environments to be an absolute URL as part of the domain. On the local, as you can see from here, I usually just chop off the, the, the .com part, you know, um, edit your host file. Anybody know what that is? So back in the, back in the day before um, DNS uh, was anything, uh, everybody on the internet used to download this text file that said, hey, if you want to go to, 
and obviously Google wasn't around back then, but if you wanted to go to google.com, here's the IP address, and it was this text file that mapped them. Every system, your Windows machine, OS X, every Linux box has a host file. And what you can do is actually point it to your local and give it any name you want. Uh, as you can see, the server name, test, that's my domain name, star.test. Now I can actually do uh, wildcard subdomains on a domain that doesn't even exist. But my host file is basically saying, hey, when you request this in your browser, it tries to go to DNS and says, wait a second, host file you know, short circuits that. It can actually create, you can make up domain names all, all day. Um, you may have, if you're doing a lot of stuff with cookies, it doesn't mess with anything WordPress out of the box with cookies, but some more advanced cookie stuff, um, you may find you need to add like a, a fake TLD, so some people do .local or .dev or something like that. You may need uh, to add more, but I, I usually go with this um, and use a very similar naming convention. You know, I take the production URL, chop off the TLD, that becomes the folder name, the repository name, the database name, a lot of things like that. So, you know, again, you want to make things consistent and, you know, things you can count on. Um, so, when you're working with the absolute relative URL problem, you know, your dev server, you know, buy a domain name. Ours is preview the project, right? And every project is a subdomain of that. You know, so it's client name dot preview the project dot com. That's our dev name. We you know we protect it with uh, HT password, and then you know so then turn off like uh, you know pinging Google and all that kind of stuff while we're in development. And we're we have the root of the site. Same with all your other environments. Um, you know, if if sysadmin stuff and DNS stuff doesn't make sense find a smart friend and hire him for this stuff or at least get you going. If really, once it's in place, it's very easy to keep um, and maintain. Uh, but definitely putting things in subfolders means that you have this extra folder you now have to remove when you go to um, push to production and just, you're always gonna miss one. And you're gonna you go, yay, we launched. All our images are broken. Uh, so this, this helps avoid some of that. So data content synchronization um, you got to schlep the data around somewhere along the line. Your client's going to get access to maybe your staging environment or something. They're entering content, or you know, you built a custom post type and sat there and entered a bunch of test content, so you had stuff you can work on. Um, and you need to synchronize that around. Uh, this is it's it's a messy problem. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, it requires scripting. Um, WordPress unfortunately doesn't have. Uh, uh, and, you know, data migration tools or anything like that. Um, I mean, they sort of do with the upgrade, but it's only one way, not reverse. If it could actually downgrade a database, um, being able to do this more inside of WordPress would, would uh, become possible. It's not. I use a tool called Navicat. It's a GUI for MySQL. It has data synchronization um, built in. You can, you know, set um, shortcuts. You basically pick two servers, pick two databases and sync between them, moves them through lightning quick. Um, it's equivalent to d downloading a PHP MyAdmin export file and importing it into the other environment. Again, your configuration file is going to make sure that the things that matter are synchronized, but moving this around um, with a tool like Navicat just becomes, I mean, literally a 10 second operation. I hit a button, I go get a cup of coffee, I come back, my databases are synced. You do need to understand, though, where, where your data is at. Which, you know, which one is got the most recent version of stuff? Which one's got the most recent version of the configuration? So what you end up needing to do is bless one server as the source of truth. I usually use our dev server for that. So if you have configuration options that your widget needs, you know, build the plugin, you test it at local, you may throw in some stuff at it, you know, get it on your dev server, go configure it there, then sync down to back to your local, and everybody syncs that configuration down that wasn't working on that widget, now has the latest version of net, not only the code, because you put that in your source control repository, but also the latest version of the data as well. Continuous integration. These are the robots you employ to make sure your dev server is up to date. Basically, it's a background process that does nothing more than check out your code every 15 seconds to dev. That means no one has to SSH in there, run SVN up, or anything like that. Um, so if you're using source control and you're using it to deploy to each of these environments, you know, getting one that's automated and automatically pushing configurations, um, excuse me, um, pushing code to that server means it's always up to date. Your client can always go and check or you can go and check and that kind of thing. Um, 
some software that I've used in the past. The current one I use is cruisecontrol.rb. Um, it's a, it is a Ruby package. Um, works with Subversion or Git, which is why I use it. Um, CI Joe Integrity are lightweight Ruby solutions that only work with Git. Um, and I believe CI Joe is very GitHub centric. So if you're using GitHub as your source control um, tool, then or you know, hosting platform, then that'll work. Hudson is a Java app. It can do anything, everything. I found that it was very memory intensive, and every time I turned around, my build stopped running, and I'd have to recreate them. So, uh, but those who like know how to run Java apps and configure them and and stuff like that, um, swear by it. Zinc is the only one that I know of that's built in PHP. Um, it uses a lot of like pair libraries that conflict with each other. I had a hard time getting it running. And then even while it was running, the report screen's never updated. So uh, you may have better success with it. Um, there's a few other ones out there. I think there's a PHP cruise control, uh, something that plugs in with Zinc too. Uh, there's a lot of options. Cruise control.rb though is, is pretty straightforward. And you can also customize the design. So it's got a, like a kind of a, uh, a light theming layer. So it's pretty easy to hack on. Um, so yeah, now you got continuous integration checking out your source code. But what should it do after that? This is where you build a, you write a build script. Um, mostly, uh, Fing is written in PHP. Apache Ant is um, is kind of the granddaddy of this. It's been around forever. It's basically an XML file that says, here are all the things you should do. You know, make sure WP content is writable by the server. Uh, delete temp files. Um, uh, Zip up, you know, do a database dump, you know, I mean, an automated database dump. I do that um, in some of my build scripts. Um, zip this whole thing up and put it in this one folder. So, um, you know, maybe I'm working with another development team and they were outsourcing to us and we can, you know, not only give them source control access, but we basically can give them like a nightly build. Every time we check in, there's a new zip file, that kind of thing. There's so much you can do um, with it. You can run automated testing and unit testing. Anything that you can kind of think of that you would want to do manually to operate on the site to ensure that it's working once the new code is there, automate it. And uh, Fing is, is, is really lightweight, very easy to use. Um, one step deployment. So basically, you want to be able to push a button and have it deploy. It is possible. That's how Twitter does it. That's how all the big shops do it. They hit one button, it deploys. Now, uh, Twitter had to write their own um, software called Murder, like a murder of crows, um, uh, to deploy to hundreds and thousands, you know, right? They have a, they, a huge server farm. You really just want to basically reuse your build script, uh, void FTP, um, and, uh, and, you know, your source control software should already be that thing that keeps the integrity of all the files you want to um, update. So if you're on your, your site and you're trying to upload through FTP and then, um, you guys have Comcast, right? You somebody on, you know, your ISP decides to shut you off for five seconds because you know the power went out or whatever. You know, FTP is so prone to corruption of files. It says, "Hey, I uploaded everything," and then you're like, "You didn't upload these 17 things," or there, you know, and all kinds of stuff. So you don't want to use FTP if you can, if you can avoid it. Not only is it insecure, it's antiquated. Um, uh, using source control is going to be a lot faster because it's either going to you know, check everything out or it's going to fail and not check anything out. Um, and reusing your build script um, and automating this and having different versions of your build script for different environments becomes uh, your best friend. You should be able to basically jump on your command line, run your build, and send it out. You could also look at things like Capistrano. I've been playing with that. It's a Ruby tool um, that is built for d doing deployments. There's a couple of unique things about WordPress that make it um, tricky, especially the WP content folder. Um, most specifically, the uploads folder is something you got to treat with, uh, with care. But I've, I, you know, I have a couple projects that I can actually push with, um, with uh, Capistrano. So um, this brings us to iterative development. Uh, how many of you practice iterative development or agile? methodologies at all. Basically, make small changes, see it run, you know, and, uh, and just keep going. And it actually does improve the quality of your code. It allows you to build things in small increments. And really, the whole time you're doing that, you're thinking, how does this fit into the larger whole? And you get closer and closer. And tr instead of trying to like write a bunch of code and then let me go test it, just do things in very small increments. And it goes hand in hand with, um, 
with a lot of other development practices. Um, you know, uh, we don't we don't employ like pair programming or extreme programming or any like specific methodology. I usually steal, beg, and borrow from from the best and just implement what works for that team for that project. You know, we do um, daily stand up meetings from you know, which is from the Scrum methodology. Just just look what's out there because there are a wealth of information um, about how do you define your own development process or what are some out there that work. Um, and then, of course, which ones don't? And you may find that you're, oh no, I've been doing waterfall all along, you know, and, and which is kind of an uh, an old style that um, has been proven time and time again to make you know blow budgets and timelines and all kinds of stuff. Where doing it small and estimating, you know, just a couple of weeks and working in sprints and time boxing your work really allows you to just build things slowly and being able to measure the progress. And that measurement that you make at the beginning of the process is going to be less accurate than it is two weeks in and four weeks in, you know, and as you get more familiarity with the project, you can go, actually, I can do that widget in an hour, you know, and you sit down and do it in an hour. You know, at the beginning of a project, everybody's really excited, you know, so everyone's slashing their estimates by a third because they're like, yeah, I can write that in a day, and it takes two weeks because X, Y, and Z wasn't considered or, you know, um, and then, you know, some library failed on you and that kind of thing. So. Doing things in small cases is really going to feed back into your, you know, into your proposal process and being able to go, you know what, I know how long it takes doing these things because I've been measuring and looking at it and studying it all along. You want to be loose, you want to be flexible. None of everything I've said up to this point and everything that, you know, the, the leaders of the Agile movement and the manifesto that was written um, for the Agile community and um, none of these are absolutes. So you want to be able to adapt to change quickly and lower and minimize the cost of development, of making changes. Your client is going to change their mind. You're going to change your mind about how something should be implemented. And having a flexible process that adapts to change quickly allows you to do that without going, oh, we've got, we got to spend a whole other month rewriting something. You'd be like, you know what? We made some bad decisions here. Let's refactor and move on. And you know, a couple days later, you got a much cleaner code base at the end of it. Um, so automated testing covers a lot of things, but it's essentially the code you write before you write code. Um, Test-driven development, has everybody, anybody heard of that? So basically, um, there are tools to write tests to test your code. Um, in the larger WordPress, WordPress world, it doesn't really work. There are some like unit tests that have been written. Um, who's, who's, Anyway, one of, one of the core developers, kind of, it's, it's a pet project of his. So there are some things that are, are, um, that are unit tested this way. Uh, I, anytime I write a library function, um, like I wrote a comparison engine um, uh, for uh, user profiles and like trying to do like a user matching thing, the entire library was completely unit tested. And it allowed me, and what test-driven development allows you to do is sort of, you define a test that it fails out, out the gate because you, don't, you haven't written the function you know, or any code for that function that you're testing. Once you sort of know how a test should pass, then you write code that passes that. And what it allows you to do is actually kind of design, say, an object or a set of functions um, in a very clean, clean way. And it actually shapes your thinking while you're doing it. And of course, it allows you to um, uh, uh, ensure that when you write new code, it doesn't break old code and that kind of thing. Simple test and PHP unit are both um, PHP based. PHP unit is the one that WordPress does use. Um, I like simple test a lot better because it's a little more lightweight and um, though there's more development on the PHP unit side. So uh, they're both good and it, you know, it's something definitely to explore, um, especially like I said, if you're writing like a big class system that then is going to you know, basically provide data or provide functionality to a plugin. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can have it tested um, and write tests for it. Selenium does front-end browser testing, so it's functional testing, but you can automate and script that, and there are lots of tools um, and, uh, around Selenium. It's a, it'll take you a little bit to get your head wrapped around it. There's um, a Firefox plugin that allows you to, like, run through a series of actions, recording all of them as, like, a Selenium script and that kind of thing. So these are some things definitely to look at. Um, but it really, it, it just lowers the cost of making changes. And if you can do some testing, um, it's, it's going to be worth your time every time. So as you can see, each piece just keeps stacking up. 
you know, with a task management system and source control software that works together, it allows you to close tickets while you're checking in code, allows you to manage your tasks and see everything that there is to do on the project, defining what success is, you know, just, just provides that, that foundation. The multiple server environments give you some predictability about where your code lives, where it should live, and who can look at what. Um, configuration and data synchronization are going to keep everything in sync and everybody on the same page, which is very, very important. Um, and where a lot of people, I think, stumble with this. They, they use source control, they kind of just use it just to, you know, they know they should and they kind of as a, as a backup system, but, you know, uh, when, you, when you use it that way, you tend to not commit for days. You have large uh, problems merging back in because, you know, somebody else committed something after waiting a week and, you know, trying to get everything on the same page um, is, is difficult. Um, I split my teams up between design and dev. I usually pair a programmer um, with a front end designer. And uh, you know, so somebody's basically making the back end and somebody's making the front end and they kind of just keep meeting in the middle and, and you know, hey, you know, um, I need this markup. Usually it's the designer asking for stuff. You know, I need this markup to come out of this widget, that kind of thing, and allows them to do. I have taught more designers to use source control than I can count. It's not that hard. There are GUI tools, but most of them, especially on Macs, eventually even, they actually switch to the command line. Um, if you're not using the command line now and you're a developer, do yourself a favor, learn the commands directly, because th when you get into a problem, it's the only way out. The GUIs are great, you know, or maybe you have some integration with your, uh, with your code editor. That's great for, you know, doing your small commits and stuff like that, but any big operations, um, you know, use the command line tools. It's, it's really gonna save you a lot of frustration in the, in the long run. And like I said, I've known developers that, that have been able to pick it up. Um, you know, they still need help and stuff, um, but once they get the value of it, once they go, oh, we both edited the CSS file, the merge went by, you know, completely automated, there was no hitch there, and they really start to see the value of it. So, I mean, everybody who needs to touch your code should be using source control. Um, and then the, the last stuff, you know, the continuous integration, one-step deployments, automated testing, this is really like the gravy you add on later. Once you get the, the first half of this like down pat, then you can start to automate more and do things more. But really, um, in, the, in the kind of the way that, because um, uh, I've written command line scripts and all this stuff customized over time that, I mean, I can do things and I got shortcuts and I got aliases, but when I teach people my process, and I've implemented this at big studios, at large, stu you know, small studios, big companies, um, and every time I did it made things better. It made developers happier, it made management happy. Um, when I uh, came on board with Blueprint Design Studio a few weeks ago, they were having, a, you know, they had a big backlog of work. Only one developer was basically pushing it out and they were using some remote teams, but the quality of the code wasn't that great. And now we're shipping five projects a week. We're getting all that backlog off only because of this process alone. So it, it, it lowered our amount of time and it lowered all the, hey, where'd this go? And let me FTP this and they were using subfolders on a dev server, nobody was running locals, like, I mean, it was a mess. So getting in there and helping them just structure out how they develop and how they manage their code um, and being able to lead that charge and, and, and really understand their businesses, I mean, now we're on track to, you know, we're taking on huge projects where they were flipping like template redesigns and stuff. You know, now we're working on, you know, some, uh, some projects of significant scope and it was only because we had this in place that we were even able to bid and win on those. Um, those projects. So this is worth learning. It's your, it's your craft. And if you do not care about your craft, get the hell out of my industry. Really, this is a science. It's an art. This is something that, you know, most of you I know are passionate about WordPress, passionate about the stuff that you do. Th paying attention to the details, knowing your tools makes a huge difference. It makes a difference to you, your clients, and your teammates. And that's really the, the, the key thing is you want to make sure you're operating in a consistent way so that your teammates can count on you. When you go sick or want to work from home or whatever, this is going to be the thing that allows that. You know, um, we have a policy of, of flex time and you know, work from home when, when you need to. I mean, we love people being co-located because obviously being able to go to the whiteboard and you know, work out a problem. And uh, you know, when you're looking at this, and there's obviously a lot here, and I know I laid a lot of information on you, um, and the slides will be posted um, to zentech.net, my website, um, uh, probably tomorrow or something. I might not get to it today. Um, 
you know, look at this. Look at what you've been doing, you know, and see where you can improve. And do it in small steps. You know, every time I, I um, implement this process, I don't walk in the door and say, okay, here's the 10 things we're going to do all at once. It's like, are we using source control? If not, that's the, that's the first thing. You know, where are we, you know, how do we define our projects? Where are those? Are you just sending people off with a PSD and hoping for the best? You know, um, so we get a ticket system in place. And then from there, you just start incrementally adding things. You know, reminding people, hey, that, commis that commit message told me nothing. You know, make sure you're telling me why you created something the way you did. You know, not just the what, because I can see that from, you could have a blank commit message, um, and I'd see that. So don't repeat, don't repeat yourself there. And just really keep improving, keep getting better, you know, um, because when the whole team's rowing in the same direction, amazing, amazing things can happen. The team is smarter than the individual every time. And your process, uh, we're not a service company, we're a process company, and our process is our product. That's what we sell. We can guarantee you that we can take your idea from conception to um, you know, completion because we have a process. We know how we're gonna walk through it every time. We have a million checklists for front end and back end stuff that are unrelated to this process, but just you know, getting that defined and knowing that this is what I give you. you know, I've done this a million times, I can do it again, you know, and this is why you should choose me over Joe Blow down the street who wants to use a .NET solution. Thank you very much. Uh, track works with Subversion out of the box, and it works with some other ones with some work. That's what WordPress uses. Um, free, both free. You'd have to, you know, you can install them on any virtual, you know, VPS kind of kind of server. You could do it on a local box, even you know, if you work in an office or something. I like Unfuddle. Um, the, you know, I, I pay forty dollars a month. You have unlimited repositories, about four gigs of space to store stuff in. Um, I store, we store all our PSDs actually also in, so it kind of bloats that a little bit, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can start really cheap. Once you get to a certain like number of projects, they start charging you more, and then if you start running out of space, but they're actually a little real flexible. I recommend them highly. Uh, they're, uh, what, what's that? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, and, if it, and really, you know, you don't have to use Subversion, but um, like Bitbucket is another one. GitHub has. Yeah, I don't like the ticketing system on there. So uh, there are some other things um, that you can use that um, that allows you to do that. Um, I mean, really, even um, I, I mean, really, you, you can find something that works. I, and there are tickets there. Lighthouse app actually is, is a bug tracker that plugs in. It's another service. There's not, I don't really care for that one um, as much, but it plugs right in with Git. Um, I, and really, there's complaints I have about Unfuddle. I mean, one of these days, I swear, I'm going to build like, the, the, the system that does the build, pro, you know, basically integrates continuous integration into my ticketing, into my source control, and probably make it open source and host it on one place. Um, but I, you know, I haven't got around to it, so I just use Unfuddle, which does Git and Subversion, by the way. So it does allow for both of those types of repositories. Any other questions? There are. There's something similar, but I don't know if there's a PHP um, thing. You could also. I mean, there's a. You could set it as a um, an environment variable at the operating system level. A lot of PHP can read those for Windows and um, Linux, so you could do it there. Uh, you could do it in a file that just gets read. I mean, it, it, all, you, all you need is some way to mark this as this, and that PHP can read. I you know, take advantage of Apache because it's there. And what are you using for in the next ditch? Are you using FDM? Uh, I've been playing with it because now it's built into 5.33. Um, before that, I just let them zombie out and restart them when I need to. I haven't had a lot of as much trouble as other people have had. Um, but yeah, I mean, PHP is a fast CGI, and the latest build has it built in and actually works pretty good. I've, I've, I've been using it a lot. Yeah, there's, there's some uh, incompatibilities with Nginx with WordPress. There's some plugins that fix that for some things. Um, and I've had to fix it for like HTTPS stuff before. But like some off the shelf plugins, which we generally don't do, we pretty much write that one hook override, you know. Um, so we, we try to keep things small um, in that case, but uh, yeah, so it, it tends to work out. Any other questions? We can take any more questions to the bar. That would be awesome. We need to run over to the other room real quick. Do some closer remarks.
Bears and UFC in like five minutes. Yeah, okay. Thank you.